welcome to this episode of the Data.com series. Today we are going to be talking about chaos engineering and how we do chaos engineering at Data.com. Uh, this is a series of webinars where we invite Datadog engineers working on interesting projects, on interesting technologies, to talk to us a little bit about how they use those technologies or the processes, etc. So if you want to watch uh, the previous episodes, you can go to datadogon.datadoghq.com uh, and you can see there all the episodes from the previous ones and also register for the new ones. So um, welcome everyone. A little bit of housekeeping items. So we hope to uh, leave at least 15 minutes at the very end, 10, 15 minutes for questions, but don't wait until the very end to start asking questions. If you have any questions throughout the episode, just uh, use the Q&A button on your Zoom client and leave the questions there. There is also chat functionality uh, feel free to use the chat functionality to talk to other attendees, to, to comment on things, to say hi, uh, to say where you're coming from, uh, what you want to say. But uh, for the Q questions, please use the Q&A button so that way we don't miss any of the questions through the chatter of the chat window. Cool. Um, so just to get us started, uh, this is not, and Datadog On is not a series about Datadog itself. Uh, in most cases, it's more about how we build the product, how we build internally that product. But just so you know, Datadog is a monitoring and analytics platform that helps companies improve observability of their infrastructure and applications. Um, my name is Sara Polito. Uh, I'm one of the co-hosts for this series. So if you want to reach out, add feedback, um, propose new topics that you want us to cover, uh, please reach out through that email or my Twitter handler. Uh, but the important people today, we have today Joris and Tay. Uh, Joris, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So my name is Joris. I joined Datadog uh, as a central BT engineer three years ago now. Uh, so I'm mostly focusing on chaos engineering and I'm now working as chaos engineering team. And I'm Tay Nishimura. I joined the team uh, approximately eight months ago. Um, previous to this, I was not an SRE. I was a software engineer doing mostly application work for five years. Fantastic. Cool. Um, so we usually start this episode talking a little bit about uh, Datadoc scale and what the scale we run on. The reason why we do this is because some of the decisions, actually many of the decisions that we have to make are based on that scale. So I think it's important to, to give a little bit of overview what we're talking about so people understand why we made some of the decisions we made. So just to give some numbers, uh, Datadog health more than 12,000 customers. Uh, we are a monitoring platform, so obviously we have to get the information from hosts from those customers. Those add up to millions of them. Uh, and that adds to trillions of data points that we have to process per day. Today, we are going to be talking about case engineering and we are going to be talking a lot about our Kubernetes environment. And our Kubernetes environment is dozens of clusters, some of them with thousands of nodes. And we also run off on several clouds. So that's, that's more or less the scale that uh, Datalog is running on. Um, and you would probably see some of the decisions that we made based, based on that. But let's uh, start digging in the, the topic that we have today. Uh, so what is, what is chaos engineering? Yep, so I think we can go with the next slide directly because oh, that's a good introduction to chaos engineering. So that, that's a definition I both love and hate for multiple reasons. Um, <laughs> That, that, that's an official definition of, uh, of chaos engineering, but the issue with that, well, that the good points of this definition is that that generic enough and it covers the end goal of chaos engineering. Uh, what I hate about this is that, unfortunately, it's not close to reality for most of people doing chaos engineering, including Datadog, of course, uh, but still, it's a really, really good one to start with. Um, so I won't explain the whole sentence. Uh, we'll just focus on two things, uh, and it's about building confidence and in production. Um, so the first question I think 
everybody has uh, when you talk about like breaking thinking prediction, because this is what we're talking about. Uh, people are like, why, why would I do this on prediction? Um, there are multiple reasons. The first one is that this is where you have your, your business and this is where we have the business. Uh, so of course, this is the environment where when it's broken, uh, you are losing money, it's not a good thing. Um, and th that's why it's a critical environment, let's be honest. Uh, this is also where we have outages. I mean, when staging is broken, of course it can be bad. You can block some deployments or something like this, but that's not, I mean, that's not that critical. Uh, you're not calling an outage for staging, you know. Um, this is also where the real, well, what we call the real world, because um, how to say, most of the time you don't have an equivalent of prediction. You can have clusters uh, as close as possible to prediction, but because something is working there and is resilient there, doesn't mean that it will be on prediction. Um, and the very last thing is that it's supposed to be the safe place. It's supposed to be where everything is working as expected and where you want, you should feel safe. Uh, and the second thing is about building confidence. Um, so if you can just yeah, go to the next slides, please. Thank you. So this one is a bit strange because how am I supposed to build confidence in a system uh, that, that's that, that's really hard to define, but we can go with some important points. The first one is about recovery because like when your system is down, uh, that's a thing and you can't avoid this. Uh, what you can work on though, is that your system is able to recover automatically without involving and engaging like 10 engineers, for example, uh, for uh, eight hours trying to, to make it up again. Um, we often talk about blast radius during in chaos engineering and incident remediation as well. Um, Limiting this blast radius is super important. So you can have like part of the system being down without bringing down everything. Uh, and the very last one, which is definitely, uh, I would say the job of Datadog is about observability. Uh, so having metrics and everything is fine. Um, a good observability though, is to be able to say, of course, so when the system is broken, but also when does it mean to know if the system is broken now, but also was it broken uh, an hour ago, for example, um, to know how much it is broken, like what is working, what it's working. It's also important to know what is working. And the most important is to know how much time would it take to recover from this, uh, like this outage. Um, I think that's it. Cool, so one of the things that I, that I see um, every time that I see someone describing chaos engineering is that it tends to be very different from company to company. So obviously what we are going to be talking about today is how Datadoc to chaos engineering. Um, and I think that's that's important to, to mention because I, I've seen so many different ways. Uh, so so Tay, uh, do you want to give us an overview of, of how we do things at Datadoc? For sure. Uh, so Datadoc does have quite a history with chaos engineering um, and part of that is uptime is crucial to our service. Um, it's part of our business. So especially as we're scaling up, we want to do a lot of it. Uh, and let's talk culture, um, the culture of resilience. So people are at the center of enforcing resilience. And this is because as Ara mentioned, chaos engineering is company specific, but even further than that, it's team specific. It's your application specific. So it needs to be a distributed effort. Um, and therefore, when an incident is painful, we want to get ahead of it. Um, so I thought we could share a bit of history around this. Um, so the first automated chaos at Datadog was in the form of Lambda functions, which given some auto scaling group in AWS would kill a random EC2 instance. Um, and this happened pretty regularly in production once a day. Um, and this served pretty well because you have to make sure that the load can be balanced by the rest of the instances that are up. Uh, we also started doing game days, um, which are a generic chaos engineering term. But for those of you who are not familiar, you plan scenarios of abnormal situations that an application is facing. Um, and you try to guess ahead of time what your expectations for that failure are. And then after you run the game day, you figure out uh, what are things that did not go as planned and how can we prevent them from happening in production. Usually the first few are done in staging for us and then we move to production. 
Um, how did we do this? In the beginning, we used IP tables. So we would SSH into an EC2 instance and run uh, commands that would allow us to drop a percentage of network traffic, for example. So here in this uh, image, we are dropping traffic that is destined for service A, 50% uh, of it, using this command line tool. Um, this was great, but it wasn't scalable. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I think, I think uh, w one of the things that, that, that happened was um, that this was very successful. More and more teams wanted to, to do their own game days, which is, which is great. And also um, that I've moved uh, to Kubernetes, which also made things a little bit more complex. Um, so why, why those two things um, make things a little bit more complicated to, to do all these things manually over and over again? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we work with networking. So as a refresher, Kubernetes is a container orchestration system that automates deployments and scaling of applications. And we like containers because they're less overhead than virtual machines um, and they're portable across different compute environments. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, you're going to see these little icons. The top is a container, um, a grouping of them, a pod. This is how you make sure that you deploy the same thing every time um, is uh, represented below. And finally, these big purple boxes represent nodes, which are Kubernetes abstractions for virtual machines are, or physical hosts. So this is great for abstraction, but it does complicate our networking. Um, so as complexity increases with thousands of nodes and production, relying on a few operation operators with mastery of IP tables to run all game days means we're limited in the amount of game days we can run. And so because of this, uh, Joris and the team embarked on a new project to help us. Yes, which bring us to, to the Chaos, Chaos Controller, which is the tool that uh, we are currently currently using. Yuris, do you, do you want to give us an introduction of what it's yeah. Chaos Controller? Yeah, sure. So as you said, we started, especially with uh, uh, like the, the move to Kubernetes, we started to have more and more game days. And also, so, so, so it means more and more people getting some help uh, to achieve those game days. Um, so we started to work on a tool which would help with this, uh, that we call the Chaos Controller, and we'll see why right after. Uh, the idea of this tool was to abstract as much as possible all the operations that you have to do to simulate some uh, failure scenarios. Uh, and we'll see later that we can have multiple of them. Uh, and also the idea was to limit as much as possible the blast radius, which is hard to predict and hard to manipulate, um, especially depending on the system, because it's really like really dependent on the system. So the Chaos Controller, uh, as the name suggests, is a Kubernetes controller. And so if you're not familiar with Kubernetes controllers, um, you, you have a pattern in Kubernetes called Operator Pattern, which provides, so it's a combination of custom resources and controllers. Um, a custom resource in Kubernetes is, uh, once again, as the name suggests, a custom resource. <laughs> so you can have, you have Kubernetes resources and you can, you can create your own resources. And the controller will help to implement your own business logic around this uh, custom resource. So the idea, with this in mind, the idea of the cast controller is pretty simple. Uh, we would provide a custom resource that we called disruption. Uh, and when you create such a disruption, uh, it would inject describe failure. And when you remove it, it will clean it up. And that's all. So the idea is very simple. Um, yeah, and we've we've open sourced this project now, so people. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we, I think it was like ten days ago. Um, so like ten days ago, we open sourced this. Uh, the idea of the open source is definitely not to provide like the tool to use, uh, because so first of all, cost engineering is very um, like very new, um, and also because, I mean, still tool built by Datadog for Datadog. Um, However, we have to keep in mind that it's a tool which is two years old now. Uh, so we have, I would say, a lot of experience about the different use cases that have been useful to us, uh, all the edge cases as well that you can meet uh, with such experiments. So that's more this, that's more like a tool 
gathering all the experience that we have around chaos engineering. That's also a tool that we are still using and that we will keep contributing to, of course. So. Cool. cool. So, so how, how does it work very high level? Yeah. Um, so that's, once again, that's supposed to be really simple. Uh, the idea is that you have a description. Uh, so once again, it's the Kubernetes resource, which can be in a, in a manifest file, so like an OAML file. Uh, you apply it, and as soon as you apply it, it will create a bunch of uh, what we call injector pods that are here to inject the failures and clean it as well. Um, and as soon as you did it, this disruption, the cleanup, the, the injector pod will take care to clean them up and then to uh, just like go away. Um, so with this diagram that we have here, we can see two, I would say two main components within the chaos controller. We have the chaos controller itself, which is a Kubernetes controller managing uh, the injector pod's lifecycle, depending on what you describe into the description. And we have the chaos injector, which is what's, uh, I would say it's the, the most complicated piece of the chaos controller because this is what injects uh, and cleans faders. Cool. Uh, so before before going to the to the complexity of, of how these disruptions are, are made, uh, so take, if you want to give us a couple of examples of how this works from a user perspective. So if I Kubernetes uh, developer and I want to to create these these disruptions. Sure. Um, so if you want to go to our repo today and get started, you'll see some examples of manifests that you can define, like the one you see here. Uh, we're going to go over each of the fields here so that you feel comfortable getting started. Um, so first of all, kind is disruption. This is just saying that the custom resource that you want is a disruption. This is a Kubernetes native feature for you to be able to um, create a disruption this way. Um, and then you have the metadata field. So the name, you can name it anything you want. It's your way of finding your own disruption again, and you put it in the chaos engineering namespace. So that's the Kubernetes namespace. And then the part we're going to go over next is the spec, which um, configures the actual disruption. So let's see what that looks like. You have the selector. Um, this can be any label selector, but for us, we're saying applications called demo. Uh, and you can say how many of them you want. So you can say count equals one. You can also say a percentage of all of the pods, in this case, that match this spec. Um, you can say two. And then you can finally say what exactly it is that you want. So in our case, we're saying here that we want a node failure that causes a shutdown. So um, that's cool, but let's see an example. So to the right here of this uh, panel, you're going to see Minikube. Um, so that's our Kubernetes instance that we brought up locally. Um, and we're SSH'd into it. And then to the left, you are seeing us define a manifest for these pods. There's three demo pods. Um, and it's the same one that I just showed you. And you could cut or apply the manifest node failure.yaml. And to the right, you see the SSH session getting terminated unexpectedly. So that is a failure of the Minikube node. Great. Let's also talk about network degradation since we'll be deep diving into it later. Um, so for this one, you can define a level. So if it's pod level, you're disrupting pods. If it's node level, you're disrupting nodes. And again, uh, we're talking about demo pods. On the right, you see a diagram. Let's say there's uh, six pods that meet this specific criteria. Um, here, we're specifying a percent for count. So 50% of these six demo pods is three pods. So three pods randomly get selected. Um, from here, we say we want a network disruption this time. So we are saying that for any packet going to host 10.128.0.2, um, disrupt port 53 for the protocol TCP and drop 33%. So in human words, drop a third of TCP traffic destined for this IP address coming from half of the pods, which was our target. So that's basically how it works. <laughs> Cool. Uh, one one of the things that I that I really really like about it is that um, from 
from a developer point of view who runs their deployments in Kubernetes, this feels very natural. So they, that's like basically using the same thing, the same uh, label selectors that you have to use everywhere in Kubernetes. Um, so this feels like very easy to, to get us started uh, bringing those disruptions into, into your cluster, which is, which is exactly. great. <laughs> um, but uh, internals, uh, how these, these things work internally. So once you've created high level, um, how the uh, injector and, and the chaos controller works internally, it's um, a little bit more complex and, and we are going to, to dive a little bit on it. Uh, so Joris, do you, do you want to get us started? Yeah, sure. So uh, I will start with like some basics about containers, which really, uh, I really won't go into details because that's not the, the, the goal of this discussion. Um, but containers are using, I'm only talking about Linux. That's something that we didn't specify, but yeah, we are only running on Linux. So um, Linux containers are using some kernel built-in features um, to act as containers. And so the most interesting ones to us are C groups and namespaces, uh, and we'll see with some examples right after why. Uh, in our case, so the C groups, for example, are used for resource limitation, like the CPU, uh, the disk, or, or the memory uh, limitation of a specific container, while namespaces uh, are used for isolation. Uh, for example, you can isolate the network stack, and that's something that you're using as well in, uh, in the Chaos Controller. Um, so I think we can go with the next slide, and we'll, we'll see with a bunch of examples um, how, how we are using this. Uh, something I didn't mention, but I mentioned before, is that in cast engineering, we want to limit the blast radius as most, as most, yeah, as much as possible. Sorry, um, and so this is what will help us to do this. Uh, so if we go with the CPU disruption, um, as I said, to limit the CPU, uh, we are using C groups and containers. Um, can you go with the next slide, please? Thank you. So when you have processes running on the hosts, uh, they will be part of a C group, depending. Um, well, for, for the different resources that they are using. Uh, in our case, of course, to the CPU C group. Um, and so the C groups are in this path, like the CFS C group, and you have the kind, for example, CPU, and you can have uh, like multiple C groups. Um, as soon as you have a new process running uh, on the operating system, it will join a C group. Uh, so it can be like the, the base C group, the one used by the init process. Uh, it can be another C group, whatever, but its PID will be returned in the C groups.prox file. Um, for containers, uh, they are using their own C group. So be careful with this. It's not magic. It doesn't mean that like creating a C group won't create CPUs. That, that's not how it works. It's really just here for limitations. Uh, still, you can specify that a container has only one CPU uh, on four CPUs, for example. And so it will have its own CPU C group, like you can see with the blue PID. Um, and so with this in mind, uh, the way the injector works is pretty simple. We can simulate the noisy neighbor uh, by just consuming this uh, C group CPU. Um, so the way it works is that the injector will create, uh, well, the, the injector pod will be created, uh, which is another container. Uh, can you go one slide? Thank you. So. As I said, the injector being a pod, it is a container. And so it will be a container living on the same host as the targeted PID or the targeted container. Uh, so it also has its own C group. Um, and so the first step is it, that it will join, kind of join the CPU C group of the target. Uh, it means that instead of using its own C group resource, it will start using the CPU, the CPU resource of the other C group, which is allocated for the other uh, process. Uh, then it will start to nice um, itself uh, to do like the highest priority that you can, that you can have uh, on Linux. And it will start using as much CPU as, as possible. Um, by being like by having this super high priority, of course, it won't allow a lot of time to the other process to do its normal work. Um, and so that's basically how it works. But by doing this, we can simulate the other process serving of CPU. And that's all. And the last thing is that by doing this, we limit the radius to this C group, which means that other processes, of course, there are some limitations, but the other processes on the other C group, like the PID one, two, three, are not impacted or definitely less impacted than if it was just like a regular process running on the host. 
So, so the goal of, of this severe disruptions is basically um, mimicking one of the containers of a pod just suddenly consuming most of the CPU. So it can be different scenarios. We can imagine different different scenarios. The first one is having a, what we call the noisy, the noisy neighbor issue. Uh, like you have your container or your process running normally, but another process that you don't own um, or, or that you own, whatever, is running side by side with it and it like highly consuming the CPU of the, of the host. Uh, the other scenario is having, uh, for example, to how to say like two type limit limitations of the CPU, for example, something like this. Uh, and in this case, you can make this process struggle to have CPU time. Cool. What about uh, network disruptions? Uh, Tay, yeah. do you want to start covering this one? Sure. So um, network disruptions work differently. Earlier, we saw that you can delay or drop traffic um, by defining the manifest, the YAML file. Um, but how does it work underneath the hood? Let's look into basics again. So namespaces. Uh, there's different kinds of namespaces. Um, and for a specific process, you can actually find the namespace by going into the file tree like this, process, PID, and ask for namespace, and then the kind of namespace you're looking for. Uh, you can also manipulate these net namespaces with systems calls such as uh, setNS and clone. And for our talk today, what you'll want to know is that you can execute commands in a namespace by doing NS enter. Um, and IPA would be the command here. Okay. So this is very complex stuff because containers are in pods or in nodes or in Kubernetes. Um, so what exactly are we talking about? Let's do a little bit of scoping. So pods and nodes typically each have their own network namespaces. This isn't always true. Um, for example, if the pod is using the host network, this would be different. But let's just take the standard case here. All right, so um, let's dig one level deeper. Uh, so each network namespace has IP tables, uh, rules, route table, and interface. And this interface is what we care about right now. So Chaos Controller's original network disruption operated on the network namespace of target pod. It's a little different now, and we'll get to that later. But let's look at this pod name, uh, network namespace now. Little more scoping, we're almost there. <laughs> So uh, there is a QDisk that the kernel uses in order to decide uh, what packets go through next. And this is what we actually manipulate. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, to find the appropriate interface for an outgoing packet, the kernel goes through the IP table rules and consults the route table. I mentioned this. And once the packet is assigned, um, an interface, it's added to the queue disk. And this is what we're gonna talk about. So we um, operate on this with our injectors to manipulate network traffic. And Joris is going to get into a little bit of detail about TC for this. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I think you can go directly with the next slide as well. Um, so what is TC? Um, at the very first implementation of network disruption, we were using IP tables. Now we are using TC for multiple reasons. I won't explain this here, but if you're interested, you can definitely answer these same questions. Um, and so TC is a CLI that you can use in Linux to do like a lot of things, uh, but especially manipulating those QDs, so QDs for queuing discipline. Um, and so you have like plenty of different QDs that you can use. We will focus only on three of them, like the three we are using, uh, the NetM1, which is used for network emulation. So basically dropping traffic, uh, adding a latency, corrupting packets, duplicating packets and everything like this. Uh, the TBF1, so we won't explain it here, but it's just, we're using it for bandwidth limitation, sorry. And we have the PRIA1. Um, so at the beginning, the PRIA1 is here to uh, handle the QoS of network packets. We are not using it like this. Um, but still, that, that, that's what it should be used for. Um, 
So talking about Prio, uh, how does it work? Because I think this is the, the most important thing of the, of the gas injector operator descriptions. Um, the Prio QDs has multiple bands, as you can see on this diagram. By default, it's three. Um, those bands are used to classify packets uh, depending on multiple rules. Um, and, and the very first one is about the Prio map. So when you create when you create the, the Prio QDs, you can specify your Prio map. And this Prio map will be used to classify packets depending on what we call the type of service. So you can see on the left that you have multiple applications sending a different kind of network packets. And depending on this Prio map, they will be classified in the three bands, like the zero, the one, or the two. And it will give them some priority on like which one should be uh, sent first. Um, yep, that's it. I think you can go, yeah, with the next one. So what happens is that the kernel will enqueue packets uh, to the Q disk, and then there will be like the Q disk will be dequeued to the driver queue to be sent with like the network interface. Um, yep. Thank you. So yeah, the, this is another view of um, of TC because so TC is very complex and like the, the, the CCLI itself is very uh, I would say hard to use, um, and so you can have different views of what is TC. I personally prefer the one on the left, like a TC tree. I know that they prefer prefers the one on, on the right, uh, on the left, sorry. Yeah, well, anyway. <laughs> so uh, I definitely prefer the, what, what you call the TC tree that you can see on the on the left, where you can chain multiple TC QDs together to have this world tree uh, of uh, with different roles to classify packets. Um, so we so we talked about the Prio map to classify packets, uh, but we are using some other techniques um, related to TC. The second one is about filters. So sure, you can classify packets depending on the type of service, but you can also classify packets um, depending on a lot of different things. In our case, what's interesting is, for example, the destination IP, the destination port, uh, the protocol, for example, all kind of stuff like this. And we also have chainings, uh, as I said, because of a tree, we can chain multiple QDs together um, to achieve what you want. And yeah. I think that's up to say now. So Prio map, uh, filter, chaining, how do we bring this all together to make the network disruptions that we do? Um, yes, yeah, so I prefer the left image, the right image confuses me, um, <laughs> Joris begs to defer, but for me to explain this to you, we need the left one. So first, we before we think about a network disruption, we first need to create this QDIS with the standard Prio map settings. So when we do this, um, previous to this, the packets are flowing in a different way. Um, and then when we instantiate this, the prioritization is exactly the same, but now it's using this Prio map. Um, but we do one extra thing to it, um, which is step two we create it with one extra band that is dedicated to our network disruption, okay? And what do we do with this? We chain to this a new QDisk um, that applies whatever disruption it is. So in this case, a net and delay to all traffic in this band. Now, uh, be careful here. Uh, the traffic hasn't gone there yet. That's step three. You need to create a filter to send packets to this band to operate on them. And this filter, um, in our case, has a destination IP of a.b.c.d, but it could have anything. It could have a specified port, specified protocol. So that's how we did this. Um, a final note, it doesn't look quite like this anymore in the repository if you're going in there trying to figure out what's going on. And that's because we also allow no level disruptions and this introduced a little bit of complexity into how we handle TC. Um, I do have documentation there. So if you want to see how we do it now, just go to that GitHub um, and I'll be making some blog posts about this as well in the future. Cool. Um, just, just to confirm, like if, if someone wants to contribute to this project, probably they, they need to know these internals. Uh, but from a user perspective, uh, only knowing how to use it is enough, or is it better to understand how how everything works internally? So there's um, there's sort of two different documentations that we provide. One for if you want to use Chaos Controller, and that's what 
uh, teams that Datadog use. They don't know what's going on underneath the hood. And then we have another one for development. Um, so that's for you to get started, learn how to debug um, the common use cases that we see for kubectl commands to assist with debugging. And then we also separately have documentation on how each disruption works, and it's in the docs uh, folder of the repo. Cool. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit. Uh, what have we been able to do thanks to having tooling that help us automate? Uh, we when we started this uh, this session, we were talking about. Um, creating those game days by modifying IP tables in a, in a manual way, which obviously didn't scale very well. Uh, so can, can you give a little bit of examples of things that we were able to do thanks of all, all of this being now fully, fully automated? Joris, do you want to yeah. give you some? Yeah, sure. So first, uh, that's very interesting, like what you said. Um, before we were really adding Repeatable rules manually. Uh, with game days, we were and we are still focusing a lot on specific applications. Um, so of course, the, the scope is a bit like restrained, uh, which is the idea, of course. Uh, and with large scale game days, we can definitely target something wide. Um, and just before starting with this, because that, that it will add a lot of context to this. When you have something failing, like you can have one failure impacting one application, and you can cope with it. Uh, that's really nice. However, it doesn't mean that if your application is impacted by failure, it doesn't mean that other applications using it won't be. And that's something that we wanted to focus on at some point at Datadog because focusing on, on a simple application and on only each scope is super simple. Then when you have to look at the whole system and what happens, definitely something else. So that, that that's why we started to run what we call those dodge gate game days. Uh, and so, yeah, I will start with this example. So, so this is a concrete example. That's something that we did at Datadog a few months ago now. Um, we wanted to simulate what would happen if um, like the DNS resolver of the VPC was not available in one AZ, like for all applications in an AZ without targeting a specific application. Um, so just a quick explanation. So of course we have like different AZs and uh, for each AZ, we have a VPC resolver, which is used to resolve external, external stuff. Um, so if you have to resolve, for example, um, an ECR registry, you will have to call the VPC resolver to know what is like what are the IPs behind this. Um, so yeah, the idea was to tell, okay, we have AZ A, AZ B. Let's let's tell that AZ A can't reach the VPC resolver anymore. Uh, what happens if AWS has an outage on this VPC resolver for this AZ? Uh, so we asked for some expectations. Of course, like every team has different expectations based on their experience, on what they know about their application and everything. And that's very nice. However, when we started to run this, we, we quickly realized that we were like far from expectations, just because when you focus on an application, it's already, I would say, too far in the system. Um, we didn't realize that some things would happen way before an application would fail. Um, so some concrete examples are, for example, if you have to pull some images from the ACR registry of the AZ and you can't resolve this ACR registry, you just can't pull images. And so you can't start new containers on nodes that, oh, like that, 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 that doesn't have the specific image. Um, that's the first issue. Um, how can I tell? Yeah, so, so just to continue on this story, if you can't uh, schedule pods on, on those nodes, they will be eventually scheduled on other AZs because that's maybe what you want. If you have an AZ down, you expect other AZs to take, uh, like, uh, to take the load of the AZ. Of course, you can imagine that it's not that simple. Like when you move the whole load of an AZ to another AZ, even if you have some other AZs to try to handle this load, when you are on production, once again, it's not the same thing as staging. You have different load, you have different things. Um, happening. And so it doesn't work like, like this. I mean, uh, quickly you have some AZ struggling to handle the load and then it starts to like to crawl down. And then you have the other AZs being uh, down as well. And well, you have the story. Um, I think that's a concrete example. <laughs> and so if you have to keep in mind something about these stories that 
focusing on what uh, on how your application will behave uh, facing a specific failure is too advanced um, because a lot of things could fail way before the application fails, which will definitely make the application fails anyway. So. Yeah. What about this other example? Yeah. Management? Um, so another another system failure that can ex affect lots of teams is if your key value pair uh, store goes down. So that's what we tried with console. So at Datadog, we use it specifically for the key value pairs. Um, and we basically simulated a thundering herd uh, where we, you pretend that you push a bad key and that key breaks off your services. Well, now they want the correct key. And so there could be a catastrophic effect um, if everyone's requesting the same key at the same time and all of this traffic uh, delays each other, um, more and more traffic comes. So we did this by first pushing a bad key that did break um, one of our critical services, then adding a drop um, of packets onto that so that uh, the target nodes, and we pick nodes instead of pods because the pods roll automatically. So at that point, the disruption is gonna lift. But if you disrupt the node itself, um, then even if the pods roll inside of it, the disruption is persistent. Um, and we just investigated how long that it takes for this critical application to recover once the thundering herd, which is being simulated by the disruption is lifted. And it turned out that um, the application recovered very quickly. Um, and so we're not always trying to find breaks. Again, we're trying to build confidence in our system. So now we can be confident that when something like this happens to this application um, in staging at the very least, uh, we haven't tested this particular one in production, it's going to recover well. Um, so this was a very fun one. Cool. Um, yeah, I think I think it's important what you said that uh, some it, it feels like because of the name of chaos engineering, like all we are looking for is like breaking things. But sometimes it's like just we have a, an hypothesis that tends to be true, and that's that's also good news, obviously. Um, after after the the game day, um, so we haven't talked a lot about how we organize these game days, like how we think about this hypothesis, how we organize between the reliability teams and the rest of the engineering teams to work on those. Probably that a whole uh, new episode uh, that, that we may, may plan. I think this, this could be a very, very interesting one. But for today, um, this is all we had for the first part of the thing, which is the content. Um, but obviously we have time for, for questions. Uh, this is the link to the Chaos Controller repo. Uh, if I didn't copy that one wrongly, hopefully. If not, probably you can you can find it. And uh, if you think this is interesting work to be working on a daily basis, uh, reach out to us on our careers page. We have openings for, for the reliability team for sure, but the rest of the engineering teams as well. And we have 15, 16 minutes for questions. The next question that we got uh, from Brooke, uh, what's the next area you're interested in adding as a chaos engineering attack at Datadog? So I'm guessing the question is, what new features are you planning to add to, to the tool so you can do more things? Do you wanna take this, Joris? With the I can. Okay, sure. So I will answer two, two different things here. Uh, the first one is about only the chaos controller, and this, you know, the other one is more about chaos entering at data without without specifying only the chaos controller. So the first one is in the chaos controller, we are working on multiple things. Um, the first group of things is about being safe using the chaos controller. We know that the chaos controller is a tool that can be dangerous if you I mean, if you want to bring down a cluster, you can bring down a cluster with it. Um, that's not that difficult. Uh, and this is definitely, it, it's related to what they say just before. Breaking things is easy. I mean, if you want to create an outage, that's super easy. <laughs> Whatever mm -hmm. system you're using, it's really easy. Uh, and it's not the idea of the chaos controller. So it's to add more safety for maybe for, well, like for a concrete example, with integrations with 
things like the pod disruption budget, for example, which is something in Kubernetes where you can tell that you won't disrupt a specific deployment if it would impact the disruption budget, and then the, you are sure that it will create an outage. Um, in terms of features, we are also working on different disruptions. That's it. Like more, maybe more specific to, uh, I would say, to applications and less to the system. Um, for example, HTTP or gRPC disruptions. Um, and the second one, the second answer is about cache engineering and data dog. So we already have some automations, um, which is not open source and that probably won't be uh, because it's really specific to data dog. Uh, we are still working on it and we will still be working on this because we want automated game things. I think that that's a good conclusion to this. Uh, we would definitely like to have automated game things. Cool. Um, another question that we got, uh, which almost you already answered, but just to confirm, um, can we take down an entire uh, AC? I could take so, Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so um, like we do disrupt entire AZs in terms of uh, like adding a network disruption. Um, how we handle an AZ fully coming down is not exactly in the in the game day space. Um, we do sometimes run incident drills around how do we evacuate a zone or a data center. Um, but we do not do that with the chaos controller. The chaos controller is designed to inject uh, disruptions into an existing ecosystem. Cool, thank you. Um, Sophia is asking, creating experiments on subsystem is very rewarding, but observability matters more. How do you make sure you're not killing your error badges and reducing SLIs while doing an experiment? You know, SLIs in this case, probably SLOs. Um, that's a very interesting question. So the, the simple answer is that you don't have such integration to something like this in the Chaos Controller. We do have in other systems that are using the Chaos Controller internally a data log to um, like make it more, so, so to have, for example, automated game days. So uh, we have some kind, some rating things like this. Um, however, like if we are only talking about the chaos controller itself, I would say we don't have such a thing. And we don't plan to add, for example, integration where the chaos controller would be able to, uh, I don't know, to call a data dog uh, dashboard or monitor to have a specific value and to be able to tell no, that, that that's a no go for this uh, disruption. However, we have such a thing internally, um, like a data dog with some other tools. So yeah, that's how we do. We're not planning to make it public. Or at least, well, not now. So, yeah, I hope it answers. Um, okay, so let, next question by Jazz. Uh, based on your experience, which kind of disruption would be a good one to start with? I guess the node failure is a good one. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you pick a pod and then it disrupts the node that it's in, it causes a kernel panic. Um, and you can just start with that. Uh, my favorite, of course, is the network disruption. I spent a couple months learning about it, but it is a little bit heftier. Um, and the CPU disruption is pretty straightforward to test as well. Yeah, I'm definitely okay with the, um, and the only thing I would add is that you should take the one which is the most common to you. Mm -hmm. It's all the, and usually it's the node disruption because when you have thousands of instances, you can expect to lose some of them regularly. So you should be able to, to it should just be nothing to you. So yes, I would pick up the node disruption as well. Cool. Um, while we, we wait for my questions, there is a poll open. Um, if you want to answer that one, uh, we ask, do you currently implement any chaos engineering at your organization? It, about 50%, more than 50% of people who replied said yes. So it seems like it's becoming more and more common on engineering organizations to, to implement uh, chaos engineering, which is, which is great to see. 
Um, probably it's uh, also a result of applications and environments getting more and more complex um, and having to do these things to make sure that, that we understand how resilient our production environments are. Um, Hugo uh, asks, uh, in your opinion, at what stage of development can a company consider implementing chaos engineering? So that's the one I think we can both answer today eh, because I think we, would, maybe we can have different answers. So um, if you have the answer in your, in your mind, you can start. <laughs> I, can go there. I don't think it's ever too early, though maybe having a full-fledged team might be challenging, but you know that's what open sourcing this tool is about. If we're as a community contributing and using similar tools that solve similar problems, then you don't need a huge budget to get started. Um, Datadog was much smaller when we started our chaos engineering experiments. Uh, but if uptime is really critical to uh, your company success, then I highly recommend to get started as soon as possible. So on my side, I would, I would have to, once again, I'm sorry, I would have two answers. Uh, the first one is for system oriented teams like a team owning and managing Kubernetes clusters, for example, I would start as early as possible. Um, so you are, because when you start building things uh, like Kubernetes clusters, as soon as you started, uh, the first thing is that you will have maintenance to do, so it takes time. Um, you will have more and more complex things, which means that you will have less and less time to do chaos engineering. Um, and it will be like, more and more difficult to implement. Uh, if you start early with like this kind of team, that's really nice because you have a safe, I would say a safe base uh, right from the beginning. For more product oriented teams, um, I would not start right from the beginning because otherwise it means that you will focus on advanced things and uh, eventually advanced pattern or, or potential issues that are maybe not worth and that began with me on like what I'm saying. It, it may be not be worth to focus on this right from the beginning, or you may spend like too much time trying to implement and to deal with all the edge cases that you can find uh, in your environments while you should maybe just ship and learn from incidents and outages. Because I think that's what we do at Datadog and I mean, in life. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's related to only engineering, like you just learn from, past experiences, uh, mistakes and everything. So I think that's better like this. Cool. Um, thanks, thanks for keep coming uh, those, those questions. This is super interesting to see uh, what people want to know more about. Um, we have another question from Jorge or George, depending on how they pronounce their name. Um, they say, you hadn't mentioned memory pressure, why? So I think the easy answer is that it's not a use case that we have a data log for now. Yeah, once again, the cast controller is, is built by data log and it depends a lot on the use cases that we have and what we want to focus on first. I think that's the simple answer. I don't know if they, you have anything else in mind to insert is that, that that's, I know that can be a disappointing answer, but <laughs> I think that's the, the truth. In another way, wearing my marketing hat. Um, <laughs> you have a use case at your company regarding memory pressure. We are open to pull requests. We think it's a great idea. Cool, also, uh, now, that, that, now that you mentioned that, how, how can people start contributing if we want? Like for example- So we actually, um, someone's already uh, reported an issue and actually an external person has already resolved that issue through a PR. We are very open to PRs. Um, we're not at the stage as a company and as a team right now, we're, we're ready to prioritize uh, external issues over finishing developing the chaos controller internally. Um, but we are excited to talk to people, to hear new ideas. Um, so do not hesitate to submit any issues you see and we'll do our best to respond to them. And if you see an improvement that you can make, we are very excited to talk about it. Oh, um, so that was the last question from the audience. Uh, so while we wait in case there are any other questions, um, I wanted to know, uh, Joris, if you can 
uh, give us a little bit of of uh, um, of, of reasons or, or what design you thought about when when designing chaos controller why you made some of the decisions that were made at the beginning yeah sure uh, just before i think we missed one question which is the the local testing ah oh, yes very um, very good yes the uh, you can answer that, that the one i post first and then i'll, I'll go back okay, to the testing okay sure um so i think um the most so yeah, when we started to create the chaos controller, so like two years ago, uh, there were some existing things, um, not a lot, uh, but still. Um, so of course we evaluated them because like when you can use something, you can contribute to it that's always better than, than just trying to make your own thing. Uh, still, we had some design issues, once again, related to Datadog. And I think the, the, the most important one is about them on sets. So a lot of people at Datadog and and outside sort of Datadog asked like, why instead of having injector pods and like you have to spawn an injector pod when you create disruption and you have to take uh, care about the life cycle of the injector pod and everything, why would you just like use the demand sets of Kubernetes? And so a quick explanation of what it is, is so a demand set is basically um, like a deployment that you would deploy on a whole set of nodes instead of deploying just like on a specific amount of replicas. And so we could have one injector pod, uh, which is a long running pod on all nodes and that's all. And we could use it, like for example, coding it with an API or something like this to inject in computers. Um, so you have multiple issues with this pattern. The, the first one is that of course, when you have to roll out a new version um, of the chaos injector, it means that you have to roll out all the pods running on all the nodes. And as a reminder, we have thousands of nodes at Datadog um, across a lot of clusters. So it's really painful. But I would say uh, if it was like just this, that's not a big deal. Um, the other issues that I have with this is that, let's be honest, at least it's like this at Datadog, I don't know for other people, but chaos engineering is really maybe 1% of the time. Uh, like 99% of the time, you are not doing chaos engineering. Applications are just running and that's all. Which means that the chaos injector would be a long running pod being useful like 100% of the time. Um, so why, uh, I mean, what, why would we, keep resources, um, uh, how to say, allocated for nothing 99% of the time. Uh -huh. that, that, that's a concrete example. Hmm. And the other one is about IP tables versus TC, but I won't go into details about this. That's really just because of different features and TC provides a lot of things that we wanted, like the delay, for example. Uh, we know that it has some limitations and that's all you have to choose, so yeah. Uh, so going back to the to the question that we had um, here that I had missed, um, how would you recommend testing locally? Uh, so we saw a mini cube demonstration. Have you found that sufficient? So most of the time, yes, but once in a while, there's something we want to check. Um, we want to deploy first to see if it works, especially if it's something to do with deployment. Um, and then, of course, Minikube is just one node. So there's that. But Doris, did you have anything else to add? No, we are using Minikube locally for development only. So that's really simple when you have to test new features. Uh, however, because of Kubernetes, especially when we talk about networking, uh, you can have a lot of different implementations. Minikube is super nice because you can use most of the different CNIs so that, um, that I would say the drivers when it's working uh, on, on it. So you can try different use cases. Still, it's never close to production. <laughs> that, that's always the same thing. Uh, so the network configuration can be very different in your clusters. So that's not sufficient when you want to try that the specific feature is working as expected for your configuration. Um, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. As they said, that's yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, that's a really simple use case. So it's, it's really nice to test, but definitely not specific. One thing that's true in all software engineering, but especially true here, uh, before you make a change, make sure you know what it did before. Um, if it's supposed yeah. to, make sure you know how it failed before, or you're not going to know if it's working. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so that brings us to our last question i hope i didn't overlook any other question and we are also top of the hour so i think we can leave it here thank you very much Tay and yuris for telling 
telling us about uh, chaos engineering at Datadog. This was super, super interesting. And thanks everyone for attending and see you on the next one. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.